It's one thing to understand theory. That's the easy part. It's another thing to look at someone else's work and identify the, the aspects of storytelling. But it's an entirely different skill to be able to apply it. So, and that's the whole goal here. We're all writers. So the story theory, as fun as it is for us story nerds to swim around in story theory all day and nerd out about all this, as fun as that is, the goal here is to apply it to our manuscripts so that we create stories our readers will love. That's the whole goal here. So if we can't apply it, it's, it's a make work project, it's a hobby, it's a something, but it's not a work skill. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 271 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Today's episode, I have an interview with Valerie Francis and Melanie Hill of the Story Nerd Podcast. And I love talking to nerds, I love talking to story nerds, I love talking to book nerds. Come on, I'm just a nerd fan. And these are two brilliantly talented story nerds who I just really enjoy listening to. Now, the Story Nerd Podcast demystifies story theory, so writers spend less time studying and more time writing. Literary editors and writers, Valerie Francis and Melanie Hill, analyze a film a week as an example of a storytelling principle. And we have a fantastic discussion. I know you're going to enjoy it. And that's coming up later in this episode. But also, you may remember Valerie, who was a guest on episode 213, putting story theory into practice, and also episode 104, Living the Writing and Editing Life with Valerie Francis. And uh, so there'll be links to that in the show notes over at starkreflections.ca. And as I said, that conversation's coming up later. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Now, Findaway Voices is a marketplace that allows you to get your audiobooks out into the global market. And one of the ways you can do that is through Findaway Voices Marketplace. Now, Findaway Voices Marketplace is a place where you, as an author, can look for a professional narrator and sort and sift and figure out the right people. But they're continuing to improve this marketplace. It's continuing to evolve and to provide both authors and narrators new features that instill trust on the platform. They've introduced Stripe Identity. This is a service that verifies your identity. It's available for authors and narrators in more than 30 countries. And once verified... Users receive a badge on their profile that indicates their identity has been verified, so you know it's that much safer for you. Now, the Findaway Voices Marketplace also features a review system for both authors and narrators, so after the payment is confirmed on a production, both the authors and the narrators will be asked to complete a review of their production experience with the opposite party. If the project has been mutually cancelled by both parties, there's also the opportunity to place a review. Users may respond publicly to a review one time. There's no back and forth response feature. If you'd like to communicate a personal note or feedback to your author or narrator, but don't want it to show publicly in the review, you can utilize the private note feature that'll keep your message between you and the author or narrator in question. Now reviews are shown on both the author and narrator profiles. The details of the book are also shown by default, and if you'd like to hide the book details, simply use the Hide Book Details toggle underneath the cover art on the review. Note that the cover art and the title will still be visible to you, but will show up anonymously to other users. This feature is one of many great features that's constantly being implemented by the great team at Findaway Voices, and it has already been positively received by both authors and narrators because it provides valuable transparency for other users on the platform. And transparency is always appreciated, particularly in the indie author community. 
Now, if you want to see how you can leverage Findaway Voices as an author, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And time for some comments from recent episodes. So because I missed a few weeks, I'm going to go back a few. There was a comment from episode 266. Let's talk dialogue with Jeff Elkins, he said reflectively. And this came from Maria Stahl. And she left a comment over at the blog or the show notes at starkreflections.ca. And Maria said, very interesting to hear Jeff talk about dialogue. What struck me the most was in the beginning when, when he said that the modern reader loses focus after reading three paragraphs of prose. So to keep their interest, put more dialogue in. That's definitely something I need to start doing in my own writing, especially in the first few chapters to keep the reader turning pages. And Maria, I could not agree with you more. I know I've been slowly over the years as I've been continuing to listen to Jeff's awesome insights uh, about dialogue and how it moves the story and characters forward is implementing that with every new piece of writing I'm doing. And uh, I just recently did a reading for Lover's Moon for a live stream. And I was asked uh, just sort of at the very last minute to read a short passage. And I wanted to read something that was a little bit spicy, a little bit hot, but I, I wanted to read something that had a lot of dialogue, a lot of the back and forth and the banter between Michael and Gail, because again, that talked about the characters, it informed the characters, it informed their playfulness, the sexiness, all those things. And again, something I learned from Jeff Elkins. And again, that's episode 266. So thank you for that comment, Maria. Um, I received a comment for episode 268, Neurodivergence and the Creative Process with October K. Santorelli. And I'm so excited, uh, I have to mention, I, I'm hoping uh, that October, who is uh, always at uh, Superstars writing uh, seminars as the uh, diversity coordinator, uh, doing an amazing job there, diversity and inclusion. In October, uh, I'm really pushing to, uh, to have October do uh, a talk, panel, on neurodivergent, uh, neuro neurodivergence, I should say, and creativity. I think that would be amazing because it was such an amazing interview. Now, this comment came from Kate via email, and Kate has allowed me to share some of the comment with you, dear listeners, in the hopes, of course, that it's going to help other people. And here's Kate's uh, message from the email. I love the interview with October. I also identify as neurodivergent and wasn't diagnosed until my 50th year as my youngest daughter was going through the labeling process as an adult. It was awesome to hear October's story. I've also found the Clifton Strengths super helpful with acknowledging my most challenging traits as my superpowers. It's changed my life. It's helped me to see some of my autistic tendencies as superpowers, which may need directing rather than management or suppression. For instance, the mental looping and getting stuck is my number six intellection chatting about its concerns in my head. I can soothe it and move on. My single-mindedness is because I have mainly executing themes in my top five with number one, restorative, number four, achiever, and number five, discipline. These are get-it-done strengths. Come hell or high water, I will get tasks done and unceremoniously drag everyone with me. It is an autistic thing for me, but now I understand the strengths features. I have the confidence to know that I'm the right girl for fixing the impossible because restorative likes nothing better than the impossible. It's been life-changing for me. From a writer's point of view, Becca Symes' Write Better Faster Academy and her QuitCast podcast has been gold. And thank you so much, Kate, for your uh, email and your message. Thank you for allowing me to share that with listeners, because I know that there are more listeners who will benefit from understanding this. I know I benefited from listening to October Explain and just recognizing in, in my own nature the, 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 the way I need reward. And, and again, I was talking to uh, another author not that long ago uh, about this very same thing, and he does recognize um, there's certain strengths that he can play upon and, and again, when you recognize these as strengths, you can play towards them. And I absolutely love that. So thank you so much, Kate, for uh, all of that great information. And of course, come on, Becca Syme is gold. <laughs> all the stuff she does. If you haven't checked out the QuitCast podcast or any of her Dear Writer, You Need to Quit uh, series of books or the Write Better, Faster Academy, you, dear listener, are in for an amazing treat. 
Okay, and uh, the last last couple comments are for episode uh, 269. So this was uh, Edwin Downward uh, who commented on Twitter. And Edwin said, late getting to commenting on the latest Dark Reflections with Mark Leslie due to attending at WCW Festival, which is the Wine Country Writers Festival, and can't help but draw a parallel to his guest's journey and the opportunities of getting back out to live cons. And yeah, and and that was uh, episode 269, which was with uh, Gamma Ray Martinez, and just Gamma sharing you know, the joys of, again, aforementioned superstars writing seminars and how that led to an amazing opportunity with a publisher. And, and I just loved hearing Gamma's story. And again, the long-term strategic thinking. And the other thing to remember is Gamma also has both a traditional deal as well as self-published titles. So it's kind of living the best of both lives. So thank you for that comment, Edwin. And Edwin also left a comment related to episode 270, said, wrapping my head around the latest Stark Reflections, an entire episode on his experience at Nink this year. So much high energy, high level material to a degree I have to let it sink in in its own time while staying the course with my own writing progress. And Edwin, I cannot agree with you enough. Yes, it's good to take information in. It's good to digest it, let it sink in. But what's most important is allowing that to be absorbed while staying the course, while while basically adapting it into your own writing process, your own author journey. So thank you guys so much for the comments. You can leave comments. You can email me. You can leave comments over at starkreflections.ca. You can hit me on Twitter at Mark Leslie, you can send a courier pigeon to my house, and I really hope that, you know, I will feed it. I'll make sure yeah, after its long journey, it'll get something fed, and I will read your comment on uh, the air. So thanks so much for leaving comments, and I really, uh, it's been a few weeks, and I really hope I didn't miss uh, comments. I my, my plan is that this should be more of a discussion, and I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your reflections, because... I get to learn too, and then I get to pass on your great wisdom and knowledge and reflections onto the other awesome listeners of this podcast. So that's it for the introductory matter. I'm going to kind of skip the personal update, except to say that I'm recording this on October 6th. On October 7th, I am driving down to, uh, I'm actually going to be staying at a hotel in Washington, D.C., and then on Saturday early, I'm going to set up at a conference, the Right Women's Festival. Um, in Maryland, which is just across the river, and uh, doing a, a one-day thing there. I'm doing a talk on uh, draft digital for writers, introducing draft digital. Draft digital is sponsoring this conference. We got great bags. I can't wait to see them in person because I haven't Jim shipped them directly uh, to them. And I'll be setting up a table in a booth and just talking to the attendees about all the awesome things you can do with draft to digital So that's going to be fun. It's going to be a long drive. And the reason I'm driving down there from Waterloo, Ontario, is when I looked at the time and the, and the exchanges, the time I would have to spend, you know, at Pearson Airport in Toronto, three hours ahead of time, and then the layover and the exchange of planes, basically 10 hours drive is maybe shorter <laughs> or, or pretty close to the same time it would take to fly where I was going. But I also can be in my own car. I can be comfortable, you know, just enjoying actually having leg room <laughs> as opposed to on a plane, stretching, being able to take the draft digital banner and all that stuff on the table and the tent in the trunk of my car and stopping for a coffee or, you know, biological break whenever I want to and uh, and just enjoying the sights because this time of year driving, you know, up through the, sort of the, it's not quite New England, but it's kind of going down through New York State and uh, upstate New York, I should say, and, uh, and, and a bit of Pittsburgh, uh, or Pennsylvania, I should say, sorry, <laughs> I don't know my geography, <laughs> but Pennsylvania is the state that Pittsburgh is in, and, uh, and then kind of we- worming my way uh, down through there, and it is such a picturesque, such a beautiful part of the country. So anyways, that's what I'm going to be doing this weekend, just coming back just in time uh, to pick up my son Sunday night, because it's going to be a long drive back. Uh, Sunday night to pick him up because it is Canadian Thanksgiving. Yes, we celebrate Thanksgiving in Canada here on uh, the second, what is it, the second Monday of month. So I know Thanksgiving is more of like a gigantic week-long event in the States, (laughs) or it's kind of a Thursday thing and everyone takes the whole week off. Well, in Canada, we sort of get a day off on Monday. So Thanksgiving Monday is when we celebrate. But the most exciting thing about that, see, this was going to be a brief personal update. Oh, well, too bad. It's longer. 
the most exciting thing is that on Monday, uh, I should say Tuesday, uh, because Monday's a holiday, and Tuesday is, is the typical release day in traditional publishing, on a Tuesday, October 11th, I am releasing the 35th anniversary edition, <laughs> celebration, 35th anniversary of the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles in the Canadian Mounted. And I've got the ebook is uh, already been up for pre-order. I, I'm not going to push publish uh, directly on Amazon until really, really late on the 10th. Uh, so it goes live on the 11th, which is the release date, the Tuesday. But I did see an author proof copy from Amazon. And oh my God, it's a gorgeous little mass market paperback. <laughs> I'm doing it on Ingram Spark because I'm using, um, is it 4.25 by 7, which is the mass market size. It's not a mass market. It's a mass market sized paperback because it's not mass produced. It's being printed on demand. But oh my God, it looks gorgeous. And I compared it to a, an actual replica of the Canadian Mounted. And, uh, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about this book. I, I love John Hughes films. I love John Candy. I love the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. And I can't wait. My son's going to be with me at Thanksgiving and we can watch it and we can make the girls watch it again. Um, some of them may not have, have seen it. I know I forced Liz to watch it several times, but, um, some of her daughters have not seen it. So I have to write that wrong. Uh, and I'll force everyone who's with us, uh, to watch and enjoy the movie. Now I've watched it dozens of times recently or clips of it over and over and over again uh it, for looking for bloopers and, and and little things and 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 catching them because in the book when i mentioned the blooper i actually mention um specifically the timeline where, where it happened so i was constantly watching the same scenes over and over like when owen you know when owen uh meets them and picks them up at the the, the braidwood inn in wichita uh and that's uh the actor played by dylan baker and that's the guy who snorts and, and plays with his hat and spits in his hand and then shakes uh, Neil Page's hand. Anyways, anyways, enough. Uh, I'm just so excited that that's coming out and it's coming out uh, in time for Canadian Thanksgiving. But of course, uh, what I imagine the big push will be is the American Thanksgiving. And uh, again, I'm so excited that it's finally, finally coming out. So that's it for my really brief, you know, I said, you know, very, very, very brief personal update. Why don't we get in Actually, you know what? Hey, hang on. I mentioned uh, planes, trains, and automobiles, and I'm sure Valerie and uh, Melanie are probably listening to this. I'm wondering if they're ever going to do planes, trains, and automobiles uh, in, in in their podcast. Because I love the way they analyze movies. I love the way they break them down. Really, really great for storytelling. I'd love to see what they do with that movie. So I'm begging you, please, please, you guys do that, do that. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, for the for the introductory uh, stuff, let's get on to my wonderful conversation with Valerie and Melanie of Story Nerd Podcast. Mel, Val, welcome to the Stark Reflections Podcast. Thank you for having us, Mark. Yes, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And we're here from three different time zones, two in <laughs> Canada, one in Australia. This is so exciting. I'm, I'm glad that we were able to make this time together. Well, well, you I'm know coming. what? It, <laughs> this is going to happen a lot. Because we're different time zones, right? There's a bit of a delay. <laughs> well, it took, what was it, two months to get a slot that worked for all three of us, but here we are. Yes. Indeed. And and I feel, it's funny because I always feel like I'm, when I'm, especially when I'm talking to people in the States or in North America, I'm coming to you from the future. So I feel very science fiction-y when I <laughs> <laughs> when I enjoy especially when we do the podcast I feel like I'm, I'm already where I've been and it's just <laughs> funny <laughs> but you are you're you're what 12 14 hours ahead of us where well you're not as far ahead uh from uh, Valerie than you are from me but like it's wow it's like a half day right yes yeah that's right What's so I'm on Friday like? morning it's well so far looking out the window it's lovely <laughs> oh, great I know what to look forward to this is very exciting I, I'm always jealous you guys get to ring in the new year ahead of us yes like during Y2K we realized the world didn't end in Australia so we That's thought we'd go okay when it all happened here. <laughs> so. That's right. we were your test your, your test crash dummies when it came to the well I, was, I, I worked in IT at the time and and honestly we were worried that some of the computer systems were like I, I was working for Chapters Indigo our, our main our bookseller here for the you know uh, the databases and we weren't sure if things were going to stop so we were all on call 
New Year's <laughs> Eve, 1999. <laughs> and it was kind of like, so we're watching to see what the reports are. How are the systems working in Australia? Everything okay? <laughs> we'll have that again in 2050, by the way, because most, most of the fixes, they didn't actually fix the system. They just made the systems assume that anything uh, less than, uh, four, so it's 4.9, they assumed 19. Or if it was oh, greater right. than four nine, they assumed nineteen, and if it was less than four nine, they assumed twenty. So right. once we get to twenty fifty, we're going to have the Y two K problem again. Oh boy! <laughs> it's okay. We'll all be in the metaverse then. We won't yeah, that's notice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll all die because all the all the zero. <laughs> but 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 we're not here to talk about technology <laughs> time zones. We're here to talk about story and story nerds in particular. I, I want to start. So, um, Mel, I'm going to start with you since you're in the earliest time zone. Well, your background as, as as a writer and 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 how you got into editing and and your passion for storytelling and obviously helping others with that. Can you give me give me your superhero origin story there? Yeah, sure. So I suppose my superhero origin story comes from poetry. So I've always been a bit of a, a poet. And from a very young age, um, I wrote poetry and wrote down ideas. And I've, I never kept a diary, but I always wrote poems. And so it's, and it was never for anything other than just jotting things down and the joy of actually playing with words or getting things out of my head and down onto a, a piece of paper. And so that's really where writing started for me. And I love reading poetry as well. So especially poetry that has, it's going to sound really silly, but poetry that has paintings or pictures associated with it. Like my first book that I bought myself was actually a poetry book with famous paintings next to it. And I think I bought that for myself when I was about 13 years old. And so I've always... Well, what really... was it? That sounds fascinating. Do you remember what, what it was called? I... I've still, I can't remember, but it's in my bookshelf still. So I was, I've got a new bookshelf just two weeks ago. So I'm busy reorganizing. <laughs> and you found that, that classic that you I loved? I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and it was the first one I saved up my pocket money and I went out and, and that was my first buy it was a, a book of poetry. So, and I collect the books of poetry and my favorite poet would have to be Tennyson. So, but that kind of was always sat there with me. And then when I went to university, I did a, um, a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature and I went to a military academy. So we did a lot of war literature and I liked the war poetry more so than I liked the war literature because I felt it conveyed much more emotion in a very compact, in a very compact space. And so that's sort of where writing has always been for me. And then I just kept on writing poetry and, you know, I've got backs of envelopes and labels of things and receipts in my folders of where I've had an idea come to me and I've jotted stuff down. So then fast forward a, a few years um, after I'd had my youngest child, so I've got four children, so after I had my youngest one, I, I didn't go back to paid work after I had him and my husband and I were talking one day and he said, well, if you didn't have to go back to work doing what you used to do, what would you do? And I went, you know what, I would really like to learn more about writing. And so I started there and I just kept, I learned more about prose writing and, you know, kept, joined writers groups and started learning more and wanting more at a ravenous rate. So, and as a very time poor person, as you can imagine, <laughs> with with four young children and all of those things, I was really keen to accelerate and learn quickly. Um, and that's how I kind of came into writing more fiction, especially I really love children's fiction. I think there's a real art to writing books that engage children and um, and children from all ages, um, even adult children, <laughs> because I think they have to be in some ways better stories than a lot of the um the adult marketing or adult market and so that's really interesting for me so that's how I sort of came into writing and that passion for words I suppose is where I started and breaking down words and you know even now I still sometimes do scansion and rhyme things with my with my kids and and we play word games all the time so yeah that's where it came from for me. I like that. I like that three dimensionality with which you approach the creative spirit. That is not necessarily always just words, but it's words that come with something, come mm. with images, 
come with spoken word poetry is that is that a thing or is it always visual for you oh so I would never get up and speak <laughs> <laughs> but I am in awe of people who it who says do the do podcaster that. yes that's right <laughs> different so because because my poetry is never really for it, it's what it was really and always has been just for me although I have published some pieces it is it is super personal so it's it's just something do you know I think that's that comes from such a deep place that I'm not sure if I there's pieces that I would probably speak but I would not go up and publish a whole body of work because I write that's just for me the joy of writing. So I'm not a slam poet. And I don't think I've got the voice for it either. So <laughs> that's my out. <laughs> uh, that's that's cool. I'm, I want to get into how you guys met. Uh, but first, I want to I want to get Valerie's Canadian superhero backstory in terms of your launch into into the writing sphere. Well, like most people uh, in this space, most of your listeners and both of you, I've always been writing my whole life. I've been writing and it got to the point where my day job was just getting on my nerves so much (laughs) that I said, you know, when I was little, I never ever said when I grow up, I want to be a bureaucrat. (laughs) I wanted to be a a dream of all kids. (sighs) No, not this kid. I was a musician and I love being musician and I'm getting back into my music now. And I was a writer. Uh, and now that my nest is emptied out, I'm full steam ahead <laughs> on both. And you know, when I was about 40-ish, that's when I decided, all right, let's get serious now. Let's see what you can actually do, Francis. So in 2015, I, I wrote my first book, which was written entirely on instinct. It's a middle grade fantasy. And then I went, and in 2016 published my second book, which is an open door romance called Masquerade. And it was while I was writing that, that I started to really understand how stories work. So I I went ahead and published Masquerade. And for the last few years, I've been working on another novel called Immortal. And I, Melanie and I were just talking about this this morning, actually, my morning, last night for her, this morning for me, I, (laughs) I'm, I made the, I don't know if it's a mistake, but I, I, I decided to add up how many words I have written for Immortal and discarded. I am now at a half a million. <laughs> and and what, what is the end word count goal that you're shooting for? It should be in the 80 to 100,000 words. It should be in there. It's a, okay. a psychological thriller, a vampire thriller. So you've, so already, you've already thrown out four other books. <laughs> yeah, right. five other books. That, Five, that's, yeah, though, yeah, that's right. That's what I've thrown out. That's not included in my current manuscript. And the reason that I, I have tossed out so many words is because I was using Immortal as a test case for a lot of, as I was learning a new theory concept, I would try it out. Uh, it started as a nonlinear nested story, which I'm telling you is super challenging. And it took me a couple of years of messing around with that to discover how to write it in a linear form. Once I discovered that I was off to the races. So I am determined, Melanie and I are both determined to finish our current books by the end of 2022. And we are full steam ahead, both of us. So that's how I started. And in 2017, I, uh, you know, I became a, a literary editor as well. So I also now work with writers and you asked, you said, I want to get to know, I want to ask how you two met. Well, that's how we met. Melanie was one of my clients. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah. So that's well, how we well, met. Can I ask what the project was? Yes. It's, it's the work in progress I'm still working on. So it's a, it's about a, a boy who wants to fly planes. <laughs> And, and this is this is the work that you promise us, and it's here on the Stark Reflections podcast that you promise us will be ready in 2023. Yes, yes. Drum roll, please. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, yes, it is because I think it's getting to that. What I've been working on this story now for seven years, I think, 
Um, and, you know, for me, it's a time, it's, it's usually a time thing, but yes. And there just comes a time when if I, after this version, I've just got to get on and do something else because ideas keep popping into my head and I have to crowd, I have to say, not now, <laughs> not now, or write them down. And I just need to get this story, which I really want to tell out and finished. Um, yeah, because it, it, it's a, you know, I, I'm, I've been in aviation for a long time and I, you know, I love it and I want to share that, the joy of of, of, of aviation, um, which I think comes through in this story. So it's probably more for me than anybody else. <laughs> that, honestly, that, that maybe is the perfect, but, the perfect person that you're writing it for because it's very focused, very narrow, and, and I think that's really important when you think about that work. Yeah, and Valerie is great. So it's good to have an editor who yeah. is not familiar with that world. So the questions and the the things like we were talking about, obviously story structure, which is independent of the content, but you know, to question me about all of the the things that I need to that I knowledge I take for granted that I need to you know explain, and then how much do I explain it? So it was fantastic to work with Valerie because it gave me um, a lot of things that I needed to improve to to make the story better it was um yeah it was great and that's been what now nearly four years since we started it's been a mm -hmm. while that's why yeah. we need to get this done this <laughs> year right. <laughs> because so like me like me Melanie was using her current work in progress as a testing ground mm -hmm. right Okay. We're, we're trying out these concepts because it's it's one thing to understand theory. That's the easy part. It's another thing to look at someone else's work and identify the the aspects of storytelling. But it's an entirely different skill to be able to apply it. So and that's the whole goal here. We're all writers. So the story theory, as fun as it is for us story nerds to swim around in story theory all day <laughs> and nerd out about all this, as fun as that is, the goal here is to apply it to our manuscripts so that we create stories our readers will love. That's the whole goal here. So if we can't apply it, yeah, what what's it's it's a make work project it's a hobby it's a something but it's not a work skill and so that's what melanie and i are all about applying this theory to our work and we were using and continue to use our own work as test cases so i have to i have to ask this question then i know how much time a podcast takes and and the fact that you two are doing it from two different time zones trying to line up your schedules and all the things on your plate why are you investing so much time in this podcast when you really should be back at work on your manuscript? I mean, isn't it taking away from your manuscript? I, I understand the value of, of, of what you're doing, but you guys could do that behind closed doors. Why are you doing all this extra work to produce something and put it out into the world? Well, I can only speak for me. I'm having a ball. I'm an extrovert in an introvert's job. So it's a real learned skill for me to sit in a room by myself all day long. And like I said, my nest is now empty, so I don't even have my kids here with me. So for me, doing the podcast is a great excuse to chat with somebody else who's as nerdy and excited about story as I am. And I learn every single episode, I learn something new, either from the preparation I've done for the week or the preparation Melanie has done for the week. So yeah, it does take a lot of time to put together every episode, but it's a labor of love. Melanie, what do you think? Yeah, so I'm the same and I work best when I'm working to like um when I'm working with somebody. So I'm I'm actually more I'm an introvert, but I find that if I'm letting someone down or or um working to deadlines and those sorts of things I work quite well with. So the podcast is a is great because every week I have to show up and we have to record and we you know we're studying every week which is great, but I've also found that my learning has accelerated just because of that alone. And um, you know I've still got a long way to go when it comes to <laughs> speaking on a podcast, but I'm happy to put myself out there um, because I do like 
you know, where it's appropriate to do things that I'm a bit fearful of to sort of grow and expand. And so the podcast does a couple of things for me that way. But the theory part is the bit that I really love and nerding out with Valerie because even though we record our episode for about, it's about an hour, we spend more time just talking about the theory and levelling each other up, I suppose, and um, diverting onto whatever movie we've happened to to see in that week or book we've read that week and those sorts of things. So, yeah, it's it's that isolation. So I have, there was a really good quote this week. So we write in isolation, but we don't write isolated. I think it was a Madeline, Madeline Lengel quote. Actually, it was from... <laughs> It was from listening to your podcast, Mark, that I heard that. That sounds writers. familiar. I heard yes, that. I think that was too. Susanna Kearsley who said that. Yes, <laughs> yes, she did. And I really liked that quote. And um, and and I thought that's very true because we're in society and we're in communities and we absorb all those things. So it's great to actually share that with someone who has a writer's view of the world. So the podcast does a lot of things. And also sharing your your joy of story with other people um, through a podcast, even though, you know, you're not with them listening, it's really interesting. And I actually have a a friend at work who is not a writer, not interested in writing. He started listening to our podcast a week ago and he now pops into my office and talks to me about the movies that he's, you know, the episodes and movies that he's listening to because he's a movie buff. So, it's just opened up that door to have more story conversations <laughs> with other people. I love that. I, and I want to get into that because when, when I've heard you guys say a story theory and, and, and stuff like that, I get intimidated. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a lazy person. I don't want to have to work that hard. I just want to write stories and, and, you know, and it just sounds like, oh, this sounds like going back to school and doing academia. And is it, isn't it complicated and frustrating and all this extra work and it's going to make me bleed and sweat all over into the page. Like, is it like that? It doesn't sound like it the way you guys are talking. No, Mark, we're watching movies. We're talking about movies. We're reading novels and talking about novels. This is not dry stuff. This is a hoot and a half. And, you know, talking about why we're doing this podcast. Yes, Melanie and I are learning and we're having fun chatting with each other in our, you know, supposedly one hour recordings, which are always three hours. Let's face it. Let's be honest. (laughs) But if people who are listening to our podcast can pick up a tidbit and apply it to their own work and make their own stories better, So their own readers enjoy their novels or screenplays more then that allows them to also build their careers. I firmly like right to my core believe that writers are not in competition with one another. We are one community who can help each other all level up. You you know, uh, is it a JFK quote, rising tides raise all ships? I firmly believe that. And we all want the same thing, whether it's writers, readers, studio executives, agents, publishers, everybody is praying for the manuscript that's on their desk to be divine, to just knock people's socks off. That's what everybody wants. So if there's something that we talk about in our podcast that resonates with a listener and the listener will go, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I've done that in my manuscript, let me go in and check. Like in season two, I talked about the hero's gift expressed. And what was really interesting to me was that the movies that we instinctively enjoyed the most were the ones where the hero's gift was expressed most effectively. And where the forces of antagonism, which was Melanie's topic in season two, where that was developed most effectively. When we did the episode on wild, our key takeaway was that there wasn't enough conflict there to make this the story interesting. Neither one of us watched it all the way through once because it didn't hold our interest. And we talked about why that was because on the surface of it, it's, you know, it's two women watching a movie about a woman who's sort of taking control of her life again. This should have been a movie that we both glommed right onto, but it didn't hold our interest. So we 
really learned a lot from diving into that one and discussing okay why why did we lose interest sure there's always the t- the t- the case where perhaps it's a genre that we're not particularly keen on that happens in art this is art it doesn't matter how great the book is it's not going to be for everybody everybody doesn't like harry potter <laughs> right and and jk rowling is a billionaire because of it that's fine but as editors what the skill that we have developed is to put those personal feelings of a genre aside and look at the craft behind it. So it doesn't matter what genre we write in, we learn from all genres. And on the podcast, we're doing films because, well, one, we can manage a film a week. We'd never be able to read a novel every week and analyze it. And our listeners wouldn't be able to do that and keep up with us. But two, at a high level, Every story, regardless of medium, has the same structure. So the concepts that we're talking about on the podcast that we relate to film apply equally to novels. So the Hero's Gift Expressed, for example, sure, I'm talking about it in uh, Legally Blonde, which is one of our most popular episodes, in The Matrix, in, I can't even remember the, the movies we did last semester. All of those lessons... Every novelist listening to the podcast can take back to their writing rooms with them and look at their own manuscript. And what we do on the show is we do 10 movies for 10 weeks, right? That's a season. And on the 11th week, we do a roundup of all the things that we learned. And we sort of summarize the main points of here's what the concept is. Here's how it works well. Here's what when it doesn't work well, here's the effect all that kind of stuff. So every 11th episode is a roundup. So if people are stuck for time, because a lot of writers like Melanie have young kids, still have a full-time job, all that kind of stuff, they can jump in to those best advice episodes and sort of get the highlights of what the concept is all about. So one of my one of my fears, uh, I love your podcast, but I haven't listened to every episode. Unlike other podcasts where I just listen to them in order, I purposely go, no, nope, can't listen to that one. I don't want any spoilers because I want to have seen the movie. And if I've seen the movie, maybe rewatch it so that when I, I, I just remember it was early on. I, I think I was out weeding. It might've been the spring. Was it the spring or was it, was I shoveling? I, I just remember I was outside. I remember the sidewalk for some reason. So I don't know if I was sitting on the sidewalk weeding stuff from the garden or if I was shoveling, but I remember listening to you guys talking about turning red uh, animated uh, canadian or you know with a lot of uh, all woman power uh you know lead team for, for for that and i remember having just saw the movie so excited you guys were talking about it and then going oh my god they didn't love it as much as i did <laughs> so but but i still i still got a lot of value out of it so that was a that was a fascinating but so that sometimes happens right because it, you're not just looking at the movie from an enjoyment standpoint. You're actually looking at it through a, a, a writer or an editor's filter. Is that is that kind of how you approach it? Yeah, and this is this is this comment comes up a lot actually. So so let me have my two cents, and then Mel, I'll hand the mic over to you. I'm very greedy with the mic. Sorry. <laughs> it's the extrovert in me coming pushier. out. The Canadians are a it's... lot pushier than we realized, right? <laughs> And listen, this is the extrovert in me and I'm a performer by nature. So sorry. Anyway, (laughs) this, this Mark, you're right. This is a really common comment, but because what we're doing here is learning how to look at the craft. One of the things that I always say, and I know Melanie says it as well, is once you make that decision to be a professional writer, you have to learn to consume stories actively sure you can watch the movie or read the book as an audience member and enjoy it thoroughly no problem at all but once you decide that you want to learn creatively from the story you, you kind of have to switch over into a different gear in your mind it doesn't mean that the story isn't any good it doesn't mean you still can't love turning red but we're trying to learn the craft like what was our gut reaction? Because that's how we start. 
as an audience member, what's our gut reaction to this story? Like wild, I turned it off. And I thought I got to come back and I, I know I have to watch it and I know I'll have to watch it two or three times because I watch every movie that we do definitely twice, usually three times, sometimes four times, just in preparation for one episode. So finishing wild is something I had to do. It was part of my job. I mean, you know, it's a pretty nice job, but it was still part of my job. But when I finished watching it, I had to sit back and think, okay, where did I turn it off? What was I thinking at that point? What was I feeling at that point? Why was I thinking that and feeling that? Was I confused? Why am I confused? Uh, Am I just, did I catch myself, you know, picking up my phone and checking messages? Why didn't it hold my attention? So this is, I mean, this is the truth about storytelling. This is what we do. We're writers, we're professionals. As an audience member, you don't need to know. In fact, it's the person who buys your book, it's not their job to know why your book works or doesn't work. Their job is to pay the money, read the book, and if they like it, tell a friend about it. If they don't like it, they get to bring it back. Then, because it's our job to know how to write it. That's the craft. And if you're gonna, if you're gonna hire anyone to do a job for you, you wanna make sure the person knows the job. If you're going to hire a plumber to come in and replace your hot water tank, you want to make sure they know how to change a hot water tank. If you need to hire a lawyer, you're going to want to make sure the lawyer knows the law. (laughs) So if you're going to pick up a book or you're going to sit down to watch a movie, the audience member needs to know they're in good hands. They need to know that no matter what's going to happen in this movie, the writers got their back. They can sit back and enjoy, and it's like the best roller coaster ride ever. So yeah, do you sometimes look at a a story that you love and go, "Mm, I see the wrinkles, I see the warts, I see the gray hair, but I love it anyway. Yeah, and we've had a couple of those episodes, I think. Well, I've had those experiences, particularly when we did Rogue One. So that is a story that I, the movie that I really liked, and I like that story and where it where it fit into the Star Wars universe. But when we analysed it from a structural perspective and we were looking at it that way, it didn't work as well as it could have. It didn't mean that I don't like it any less because of that, um, but it it was interesting. And I was probably a bit less critical, I think, in that episode <laughs> compared to Valerie <laughs> because I did like it and I and um and I didn't want to lose that that love of it. But sometimes, do you know, I, I've listened um to some analysis of Thor Ragnarok, which I found, uh, you know, of all the Thor movies, I that's the one I enjoyed the most. And I know that it might not work from a from a you know from a writing technical part aspect, but I still really like it because it's funny and it showed Thor in a new way. So while it may not work in one way, there are other things sometimes that make a story work or things that you can um, overlook because there's other parts of it that are done really well and I'm finding that really interesting as we come across those movies or those types of stories on the on the podcast and as I'm reading books as well so when I find a book that I really enjoy or really am interested in studying um, a bit further I'll go back and I'll pick out things like I'll listen to it multiple times or I'll read it multiple times but with something in mind. So um, I've just read Twist of the Knife, which is the latest Anthony Horowitz book, and I really want to look how did he plant those clues and where did he plant those in the story? So listen to it the first time and now I'm going back and actively listening for those things and listening to how um, how he did that. And I do a lot of I have to admit, audio is just been revolutionary for me, particularly with reading, because you know I can I can listen to a story and still go about doing sort of more mundane routine tasks, and I, my consumption of story has gone up a, a massive amount, and I'm really enjoying that. So, 
sometimes I'd still rather sit and read a book, but I just don't have the time to be able to do that. So I do, I still do active listening, <laughs> like I do active reading as well. But I think the podcast for us, you know, when you find that thing that you want to learn more about, that's when the theory becomes fun and, and more fun because you're not just reading theory for the sake of theory. You're actually trying to find, solve your own problem, I suppose, is the best way to look at it. So when you're looking like in this particular book, I'm looking for the clues and the red herrings, listening for those, it's like a bit of a, you know, it's problem solving and and it's a mystery tour in itself. <laughs> so, I <love> that. That. <laughs> so I find that really, um, you know, at that active listening and that analysis is really important but then I like doing it as well so you know and finding the thing that I'm interested in at that particular time um is it makes it a lot more fun than just sitting and reading a bunch of story theory books <laughs> okay I, I so some I, and I understand why you guys do movies you, you can't possibly read that many books even in audio um that many times in a week for the podcast and, and it makes it easier for your listeners because they don't go oh i gotta go read a 400 page book <laughs> they can at least watch a two-hour movie but it made me curious when you talked about wild uh cheryl strayed i would be curious i would be very maybe this is a bonus episode or something that you talked about the movie but then you go back and talk about the book and the differences and because we know that movies and books are different beasts, right? They're, they're interpretations, uh, even screenplay. The movie is obviously an interpretation, but I'd be curious to see you guys attack the book. <laughs> Maybe that's special bonus content for people who support the podcast and want that extra nitty gritty. I don't know. Is that something you've ever thought about? Like Princess Bride would be another one, right? You've got the movie, but then you've got the book as well and 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 obviously really i think it's a really good adaptation but there's so much not in the movie that's in in the book have you guys talked about that at all we have because at the end of the day we're both novelists and although on the podcast our audience is novelists and screenwriters um there's we can't get into the writing of the prose on the podcast that's something that we need to sort of be teaching in a more hands-on way. So in my inner circle, I talk more about that kind of stuff. It's a more detailed level of discussion, which frankly, if we did that on the podcast, if anyone who finds story theory overwhelming, if we got into those weeds on the podcast, they'd run screaming and go, you two are loony, I'm out of here. <laughs> but so one on the podcast, once people sort of wrap their head around some of the higher level concepts, if they want more information, they can come to my inner circle or Melanie's uh, mailing list and we get into some of that there. But we are having a, a discussion about how we can get into those kinds of deep analysis more effectively or most effectively for novelists to really maybe do a side-by-side -side comparison. To me, a side-by-side -side comparison would be most useful for anyone who is trying to adapt a novel to a screenplay. So how else can we dive into text and see what is working, what isn't working? In Wild, one of the main problems, I think, is that it's a nonlinear story. And this is a... a a technique that a lot of first time writers want to use, but it's very advanced, in fact. And this is part of the reason I have written and discarded so many words for immortal, because I had fallen into the trap of thinking it needed to be nonlinear and there needed to be a nested story. And I was tying myself in knots trying to figure out how to make it work. Can it work? Of course it can. Of course it can. Maybe in my 10th or 12th novel, I'll revisit it. However, my big lesson that I learned from that is that just because a story is nonlinear doesn't automatically make it better or more elevated. The other big lesson that I learned is as writers, if we can't nail a linear story first, then we're not going to be able to pull off a nonlinear story. It's like someone who can walk around the block. You know, we can we can walk five kilometers and we can feel pretty good. It doesn't mean we can run a marathon and place in the top five in our age group. They're 
Can you do it over time if you train for it? Of course you can. Can you just wake up and do it? No, it's going to take some time because it's a skill like any other skill. Skills take time to learn. And I don't know about you, Melanie, but for me, studying stories is so much more fun than training for a marathon. I've done a half marathon (laughs) and I've been out in snowstorms and freezing rain with the ice pellets hitting me in the face running 25 kilometers. I much prefer watching a movie two or three times a week (laughs) and and studying and developing that skill. (laughs) Yeah, mental muscle, mental muscle, (laughs) more than physical muscle. (laughs) So so you've got two seasons out. I heard you call it a semester once as well. (laughs) Made it very academic and I got scared for a second. That's me, that's me. I do that all of the time. There's seasons, not semesters. Seasons, if you say semester, you're gonna scare people like Mark. So you have- I have two kids in university. So I have semesters on the brain. Of course you do, and and the cost of education. Um, But so let's look at, let's look at, so the, the first season was what theme, the second season. And then I'm curious to ask, what's coming next well i'm <laughs> i'm going to study sequences so looking at how we can use sequences or how sequences are used in stories to help you build your story to that crisis point at the end so i think though i don't know how yet i don't yet know how i'm going to explain it to everybody um so that you know people have to come on that journey with me but I do think that it's a, a useful tool, especially if you're a plotter like me, to make sure that your story, when you go to write it, doesn't have saggy bits. But I also think it's a great analytical tool after you have written your story to know what to do um, to to prop up those saggy bits. So that's what I'm that's what I'm going to do for season three. Cool, I love that. And season two was the hero's gift revealed. Uh, so I did Forces of Antagonism and Valerie did The Hero's Gift Expressed. Yeah. So you guys split each season then in, in, into something that you each want to explore? Yeah, we found that worked better, I think, this season. So the first season we both did genre because we both believe that that's, you know, that everything about a story hangs from from that principle alone. So we both did it. And what we found, while it was good, what we found is that we were both covering a lot of or wanting to talk about similar things. So we decided in season two that it would be all right if we went and studied different areas. And one of the interesting things that we discovered through season two by even studying those two different topics, they actually linked very closely together because the force of antagonism actually drives the protagonist to use their gift at that crisis moment. So that was not deliberate, but it was just one of those wonderful things that happened as a result of of studying a different story aspect. So that's why we decided to do different things. And because I think we use the podcast for our own study in our own works in progress, this is, it helps us. And then it helps us share that with everybody else. So it, it has sort of a lot of different uses, I suppose, when we focus on different areas. And in season three, I will be studying beginnings and endings. So the first act of a story and the last act of a story, because they're a pair, they're like bookends for the story. The first act is raising questions that are answered in the last act. So they they go together. Most writers can write the first act, the beginning, pretty well, because they're sort of noodling it about for five years. And then in the middle, they kind of wander and then they end up in some place they don't know. This is really a common thing. So when you understand that the beginning and the end go together, once you've got your beginning written, you know, you know, generally how the end is going to work if you understand story structure. Then in season four, I'll do middles. <laughs> Not to worry. <laughs> and, and Melanie's going to do saggy bits. <laughs> <laughs> Well, saggy bits would be in the middle, right? <laughs> that's Everyone... where the saggy bits are. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, now, I, I I love the interplay the two of you have on the podcast. I know listeners are going to love this. And, and I know that listeners have. Like, you guys have 
you know, started off uh, and, and in a very short time period, your listenership has just grown and exploded dramatically. What do you equate that to? Well, I think writers are really hungry for the type of knowledge that we're, we're offering. It's the way we put it, we want to demystify story theory because the truth, Mark, is that there's not that many concepts. There, <laughs> alleluia. When I first started studying story theory, I thought, do you guys remember Don Music from Sesame Street? Did you have Sesame Street, Melanie? Yeah. So Don Music was the mus musician and he'd be sitting at his piano and he'd be playing a, a bit of music and he'd make a mistake. And then he'd try it again and he'd make a mistake. And finally he'd bang his head down on the keyboard and go, I'll never get it, I'll never get it. <laughs> well, that was kind of like me when I was studying story theory to begin with. I thought, oh, my, my head is gonna explode. Like I can feel my brain melting. I am never going to figure this out, but I stuck with it. And it was like when I was learning French for the first time, I would just listen to um, Radio Canada and it was gobbledygook. I couldn't pick out anything. And then one day, all of a sudden I could understand what they were saying. It was the same thing with story theory. All of a sudden it was making sense. And then I could pick out any book on my shelf because I've got a lot of theory books. And all of a sudden I could understand what they were all talking about. Now, theorists have approached theory from different directions. And Mark, I think I've said this on your show before. If we were all accountants, we would all have generally accepted accounting principles and we would all know what a debit is. We would all know what a credit is. We could all create a balance sheet because it doesn't matter where in the world you learn accounting, it's the same. For us as writers, it's not the same. So theorists are doing their best to explain a concept to us in the best way they can using the way it makes sense to them. Even though they're talking about the same concept as other people, they're describing it in a slightly different way. So that's why it sounds really confusing to most people. It sounds like it's two separate concepts. So my number one piece of advice for anyone who wants to write better stories so that they can sell more books and so they can <laughs> earn a better living is when you, when you pick up a theory book, don't focus on the term used, focus on the concept that's being discussed because the term, one concept can have multiple terms and it's the same concept or one term could mean multiple different things. So it gets really confusing. Like the whole term of, Melanie said, our season one was about genre. We can't even agree in, as a writing community what genre means. For some people, it means lowbrow fiction, you know, as opposed to literary novels. When Melanie and I use it, we simply mean what kind of story is it? That's, that's all we mean. And to us, that's a really foundational principle. Like you have to know what kind of house you're building before you build it. So you have to know what kind of story it is you want to write before you write it. So if as a community, we cannot agree on what genre means, then when we get down to more um, difficult to understand and execute concepts like point of view, if you really worry about the terms on all the different points of view, it, it makes it 10 times more complicated than it needs to be. And this is the, this is the challenge. This is a, one of the reasons we are doing this podcast. Most people make story theory way more complicated than it needs to be. It's actually not very complicated. That's the beauty of it. If, for those of you listening to this show right now, if you take nothing else away from this, please believe me when I say that story theory is not nearly as complicated as it sounds. Melanie, did you have anything to add? No, I would agree with that. And the other thing, there is a lot of it. So sometimes it's a matter also of finding something that speaks to you or that you find useful or understand and to go forward with that and just start at the basic level and then you'll, you know, get that down pat and then move on maybe to something different or find something different. But I, I, you know, even though we both love reading lots of different theory books, I, you know, I think 
I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to everybody. I think you just stick with something you find and use that as your launching pad because, again, I don't think it has to be overly complicated. It can become complicated, but if you start with simple things or something that works for you, that is the best, that's the best way to grow and then and get your foothold in that and then expand from there. So I agree with everything Valerie said. That is awesome. Can you please share with my listeners where they can find out more about each of you individually and where they can, of course, learn more about the fancy new sexy story nerds podcast website that you guys just uh, just launched? Well, you can find out about me on my website, ValerieFrancis.ca. And if you go to StoryNerd.ca, S-T-O-R-Y-N-E-R-D.ca, you'll be able to subscribe to the show there. You'll get all the episodes and Bob Junkle. And people can find out more about me or contact me through my website, which is MelanieHill.com.au. And it's Melanie, M-E-L-A-N-I-E. H I double L or H I L L, I should say. <laughs> That's a very Australian thing to say doubles. Um, dot com dot AU. And we're also um, using our first names very findable on other social media platforms as well. Awesome. Thank you, ladies, so much for nerding out with me about story here, story here today. Anytime. Thank it's you. Been great. Thank you. <laughs> This is just going to be a very short reflection, but uh, just fascinating conversation. Uh, a couple things. I love I love the way they, they, they simplify, they break it down. You know, I am intimidated by things like story. I mean, I've been writing my whole life, but it still can be intimidating, and that's okay. These two break it down so brilliantly and, and simplify it. And I really strongly recommend you go listen to the podcast. There'll be a link in the show notes, of course, and just to experience. So, and, and the great thing about this is you can pick episodes. I would only pick movies or, or shows that you're familiar with and, and give it a listen. And, and, and it really, just by, by going through that process, you really understand what it is they're talking about and it is going to make you a better writer. So that's, that's it for my reflection. And my reflection is <laughs> go listen to episodes of Story Nerd. And, uh, and I hope you enjoyed that podcast. I'd love to hear your reflections on the things that Valerie and Melanie said. So that is it for this episode of the podcast. I want to thank you all for listening. I want to thank the patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections. Always great to have listeners. Always great to have you guys supporting the podcast over on Patreon. And if you want to support the podcast, you can also leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice, or better yet, tell a friend that you think would find value in these stark reflections. And so, until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com. This is not him, is it? Gee, I hope not. Are you Gus's son? I'm Owen. <clears throat> you the shower curtain fella? Yeah. Yeah, Del Griffin. How are you? This is Neil Page from Chicago. Hi. Pleased to meet you both. <coughs> I'm to drive you to Wichita to catch a train? Yeah, we'd appreciate it. Train don't run out of Wichita. Hmm? Unless you're a hog or a cattle. <coughs> People train runs out of stub, Bill. That'll be fine. I think that'll, that'll be just fine. Leave it be. Get your lazy behind out here and put that trunk up in the back. Oh, no, no, the work, we've got it. It's very heavy. She don't mind. She's short and skinny, but she's strong. Her first baby, come out sideways. 
She didn't scream or nothing. Isn't that something? You're a real trooper. <laughs> We've got it! We've got We've it already! Got it's it. done! <laughs>